The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Are you this kind of a person? You go on a summer vacation only to discover that all your worries have gone right along with you. If that's a true picture of you, then we of the Equitable Life Assurance Society would like to make a very simple suggestion. See your Equitable Society representative without delay. Ask him to fix you up with a lifelong vacation from worries about your family's financial future. Tell him you want the complete peace of mind that comes from a well-planned life insurance program with the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight's FBI file, The Benevolent Hijacker. Throughout the nation, in every corner of every state, wherever there's a patch of sand and a body of water or a cluster of trees, citizens who have worked hard all year are taking their well-earned vacations. For this short period, they are in temporary retirement from their places of business. But in at least one field of endeavor, there is no holiday season, no vacation period when work is forgotten. And that field is crime. The criminal is busy stealing, cheating, killing 52 weeks a year. And that is why every law enforcement agency, like your FBI, is at work every day and every night. Only in that way can any progress be made against the crime wave and against the army of criminals. Tonight's FBI file opens in an apartment in a smart residential section of a large eastern city. A young man is sitting in the living room of this suite. He gazes admiringly at the oil paintings that line the wall. A door opens and a middle-aged man enters. Hiya, Bob. Oh, hello there, Uncle Ed. I'm sorry to keep you waiting, kid. Oh, that's all right. Uh, Just a second, I'll take a look at my mail here. Oh, surely. Uh, I was just admiring your apartment. Oh, yeah, that's right. You've never been to this one, have you? No. It's not a bad scatter. I like your taste in paintings. Oh, I have a guy who buys them for me. Oldies, you know. Oh, that one there isn't old. Hmm? Old the girl? Yeah. She's lovely. Who is she? <laughs> a very personal friend, kid. <laughs> Lay off. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's hear about you. I haven't seen you for a few weeks. Oh, I'm getting along all right, Uncle Ed. How long is it now since you graduated? A little over two months. How do you like working for me? Just fine. Are you sure that doing all kinds of little odd jobs isn't beneath your dignity as a college man? Oh, of course not. Well, you know, this isn't what I had in mind for you, kid, when I sent you through school. Uncle Ed, I like the work. And what's more, I want to stay in it. Well, now, that's what I was hoping you'd say. Uh, what are the reports on me, then? Oh, oh, okay, okay. In fact, uh, that's why I sent for you today. I've got you lined up for a promotion. Hey, that's wonderful. What is it? I'm sending you out tomorrow night with two other boys to hijack a truck. Pardon me. What? This is Mr. Shelby's car, isn't it? Oh, yes. He called for it. He didn't. I did. I'm Miss Jackson. Yes, I recognized you. Have we met? No, but I've seen your portrait in my uncle's living room. Oh, you're Ed's nephew, Bob Norwood. That's right. Heard an awful lot about you. It's nice to see you. It's nice to see you, Miss Jackson. Uh, can I drive you someplace? Where's your uncle's chauffeur? Oh, you went to the ball game. I told him I'd stand by and take any calls. Now, where to, Miss Jackson? I'd like to go to my hairdresser. All right, hop in. Thanks. Where is your hairdresser? 12th and Main. <laughs> I've seen you before. 
Really? Where? Well, I... Your uncle took me to a football game last fall. I saw you play. <laughs> and you still talk to me? You weren't bad. <laughs> uh, you got the numbers mixed. This is kind of a switch for you, isn't it? Oh, what do you mean? Working for your uncle. Maybe. But I like it fine. How long have you been with him? Almost eight months. He says you're doing a real good job. He hey, says... Look, do me a favor, huh? What? Well, I'm a very dull topic. Let's talk about you. That would be really dull. Not to me. Look, I've got an idea. Why don't you skip the hairdresser? Oh, but I have an appointment. Well, cancel it. It's a beautiful day. Let's head for the country. What do you say? Well, I... Come on. Okay. <laughs> In another section of the city at an FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is just approaching a fellow agent's desk. Oh, Carl. Yes, Jim. Have you talked to Mr. Price? Yes, just a few minutes ago. He told me that we've both been assigned to the same case. That's right. I've already been out doing some preliminary work on it. I just left police headquarters. Well, suppose you fill me in, Jim. Okay. Well, as you know, a truck was hijacked early this morning. Yes. It was traveling interstate. That's what brought us into the case. And uh, where was this? Out on Route 17. Two men slugged the driver just as he left an all-night diner. They took his keys and drove the truck away. Was the driver badly hurt? Yeah, he's in the hospital. Could he identify either of the men? No, no one has talked to him, Carl. He's still unconscious. Mm. Well, are there any clues on the thing at all, Jim? No, not a one. I'm hoping the driver can help us when he comes to. Uh, what were you doing at police headquarters? Oh, they reported the case to us and asked me to drop over there. Oh, I see. They've been trying to solve a series of hijackings that have happened in the past few months. They were local jobs, but the pattern of operation is exactly the same as the one employed in the case that we're working on. Sounds like the work of a professional gang. Yeah, Carl, I would say it does. Oh, incidentally, in one of the cases the police are working on, the truck driver was killed. Well. So we'll work right along with the police on this thing. Well, that should be a help. Uh, Jim, what's our next procedure on this case? Well, I think we should go over to the hospital to check on that injured driver, see if he's well enough to talk. <laughs> Hello, darling. Hello, Laura. Sorry I'm late. <laughs> Honey, it's not the first time. Where are we going, Bob? Oh, someplace I thought up all by myself. Like where? Around the park in that handsome cab. Wonderful. <laughs> Come on. Okay. Haven't done this in years. Oh, you don't know what you've missed. Well, there's your other customer, driver. Shall we just hop in? Right. Here, let me help you in, honey. Give me your hand. Oh, hi. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there we are. Okay, driver, let's go. Go, Nellie. Well, how is it? Pretty collegiate, but I like it. <laughs> Good. And no one will see us. Are you still worried about that? You should be, too. Don't forget, honey. He's your uncle. I know. He put me through college, gave me my start, and I should be properly grateful. You should. Bob, there's one thing that's always puzzled me. What? After spending all that time on a college education, why did you turn to larceny? Well, doesn't being smart help? Sure. But there's so many other things you could have done. Oh, they take too long. I want a quick money business. That's why I work for Uncle Ed. Honey, do you realize that if I maneuver correctly, I can have enough money to retire at 30? Is that all you want? That and one other thing. What? You... Sorry, honey, I'm not available. Oh, now, wait a minute. Why have you dated me so much these past three months? Because I liked you. So? Why aren't you available? Your Uncle Ed's been very nice to me, Bob. Oh, I could be just as nice. Not as long as you just work for Uncle Ed. Oh. So, honey boy, let's forget about us. Till you get to be 30. <laughs> Carl. Yes, Jim. The police have found the truck. The one that was hijacked? Mm -hmm. Where was it? At the bottom of the river. What? Yeah, I'll give you the whole story, Carl. A patrolman saw a man drive a truck off the end of a pier early this morning. Yeah. Now, he couldn't save the truck, but he did arrest the driver and he notified headquarters. So a diving crew went on the job. I see. Their description of the truck proved it to be the same one that was hijacked. Have you questioned the driver? Yes, but he wouldn't talk. The police are still grilling him. And does he look important? No, I'd say he was just a stooge who'd been ordered to get rid of the truck. 
Oh, incidentally, none of the trucks ever turned up in any of the previous hijackings. This must be the way they disposed of them. Yes. And, Carl, there's another factor in this. What's that? This was a white truck. Now, that's pretty conspicuous. I don't think they would have dared to have driven it very far before getting rid of it. Mm, that's true. Now, there's a warehouse district near there. I think we should get a map, section it off, and do a systematic check of all warehouses in that vicinity. <laughs> Someone just come in. It's me, Uncle Ed. Bob. Oh, where have you been, Bob? Why? I've been looking all over for you. What for? Well, we got trouble. One of our drivers was picked up. Oh, what happened? Well, he was getting rid of that last truck. A cop saw him. They got him at headquarters now. Which driver? Willie. Well, he's pretty solid. Uh, they're all solid till the pressure's on. You think he'll talk? I don't know. I don't know. But I can't take any chances. Well, that's true. What are you going to do? I'll get over to the warehouse and move the stuff out. Take it to our west side building. Then if he does blow a whistle, the cops won't find a thing. Uncle Ed, hmm? if you don't mind my saying so, that's not the way I'd do it. No? Well, what's your idea? Well, I'd move this stuff and then get out of town. Stay away until you're sure that nothing can happen to you. Well, what would I do with the business? Well, you've been giving me a pretty thorough training. You mean, let you run it? Well, just till you get back. No. No, that don't sound right, kid. Don't you trust me? Oh, that ain't the point. That ain't the point. I don't like walking out on things. I've been in tougher spots than this. Well, then you're going to do it your way and go to the warehouse? Yes. Yes, I'm getting over there right now. Just a minute. Hello, honey. Bob, what are you doing here? Paying a social call. Darling, I told you never to come here. And I told you I was sick of meeting you on back streets and in handsome cabs. Well, aren't you going to ask me in? Okay, just this once. Thanks. Well, this place really fits you. What do you mean? Hmm, duplex living room. White leather chairs, very plushy. Oh, I'm glad you approved. Well, now, what kind of a hostess are you, anyway? What about a drink? Okay. But, Bob, I'm going to warn you now. You can't stay long. Why not? Your Uncle Ed is due here at 8 o'clock. Honey, I don't think he'll show up. Why? Oh, he's got trouble. One of his drivers was picked up by the police. He's being questioned now. Oh, that's bad. What's Ed going to do? Well, I tried to advise him to go away. Go away? Just temporarily, till the trouble was over. Wait a minute. That isn't what you had in mind. What do you mean? You try to get him to go away so you could take over. <laughs> Darling, you're psychic. I bet it didn't work. No, truthfully, it didn't. But I think I win anyway. How? Well, he went to the warehouse near where the driver was picked up. He intended to move out the stuff that was in there. So? So I called the police and told them that he was there. Ah. Oh. That shocks you? Yes. Well, I was just following Uncle Ed's advice. He's told me right along that if you want anything badly enough, you take it any way you can get it. Now, I have you. We will return in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Don... Do you think you'd know a professional worry lifter if you saw one? Did you say professional worry lifter? That's right. And when old man worry is darkening your life, a professional worry lifter is a mighty good man to know. You'll get more from him than sympathy and good advice. You'll find he actually does something about throwing old man worry for a loss. Okay, lead me to it. Well, he's never hard to find. He's your equitable society representative. If you have fears about your family's future... Your Equitable Society representative is always ready to pitch in and do a thoroughgoing job of worry lifting, which will even include readjustment income. What kind of income is that? The Equitable Society's readjustment income plan provides extra income for the widow during the two toughest years, the two years immediately following her husband's death, years in which she is adjusting the family way of life to a lowered income. You know, expenses can't be reduced overnight. It takes time. And that's why every life insurance program should provide readjustment income for extra help during the two toughest years. You know, you may have something there. 
Does this readjustment income run into a lot of money? Why, it may not cost you a cent. It may require only a simple rearranging of your present life insurance program. In any event, the man to see is your professional worry lifter, your Equitable Society representative. Look in the phone book for the Equitable Life Assurance Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Benevolent Hijacker. Sociologists have been making studies of the criminal for many years in a sincere effort to find out what makes one man a criminal and allows another man to become a respected member of the community. As yet, they have not arrived at the final and conclusive answer to that question. It has been shown that environment is very important, and yet bank presidents have come from the slums. It has also been shown that a lack of education was at least partially responsible for some men turning to crime. And yet, as can be seen from tonight's case from the files of your FBI, formal education is not the complete answer either. This man, with the benefits of a college education and an unlimited allowance, still turned to crime and ended by betraying his benefactor. Tonight's file continues at the FBI field office. Special Agent Jim Taylor is seated at his desk. Uh, Jim, I didn't think you'd still be here. Well, I've been waiting for you, Carl. And not having dinner. Something developed in the hijacking? Yes. The head man has been arrested. I seem to miss out on everything. How did this happen? An anonymous phone call was received at police headquarters late this afternoon. They were given an address down on River Street. Told to go there and pick up the man responsible for the recent hijackings as well as a goodly portion of the loot. And the tip really paid off? That's right. Well, that was a break. Who is this man? Well, his name is Ed Shelby. He has a long criminal record. And where is he now? Well, the police have booked him. He's in city jail. Did he admit to the hijacking? No, no, he wouldn't talk. But he doesn't have to. There's sufficient evidence in the warehouse to indict him, and the place was leased in his name. Mm. There must have been a number of men employed in his operation. Were any of them picked up? Two of them. I believe the police are trying to get a line on the others now. How about our jurisdiction on this? Hmm? Will he be liable to federal prosecution? Oh, the DA will work that out with the United States Attorney. But I have a feeling the state will try him first. Why? Well, there's a murder charge against him from one of those early hijackings, remember? Oh, yes, of course. Well, Carl, now that this one is over, I think we ought to get to work and write up our report. Bob. Yes, Laura? What are you doing? Just making a few notes. About what? Procedure. What? How I'm going to handle things now that I'm in charge. Oh. One question, hmm? Huh? What? What's there left for you to be in charge of? Are you kidding? No. Police have knocked off Ed in the warehouse, and they undoubtedly picked up some of the boys. I've taken all that into consideration. There's still plenty left. Like what? Well, like the second warehouse over on the west side. It's full of loot. And there'll be enough boys who weren't picked up to keep us in business. Do you think they'll work for you? Yes. Just because you're Ed's nephew? No, because I'm moving in fast. Uncle Ed always said that's what you should do if you want to take over. Oh. And that's just how I'm going to work, honey. I'm going to round up the boys now. I'll see you later. Special Agent Taylor. Hello, Jim. This is Carl Spencer. Oh, yes, Carl. I'm down at police headquarters. For once, I'm getting a chance to give you some news. Oh, uh-huh. what is it? Ed Shelby's broken out of jail. What? When was this? About an hour ago. How did it happen? He asked for permission to see the prison doctor. Mm-hmm. He was allowed to go to the doctor's office unescorted. En route there, he shinned up a pipe to a window about ten feet up, unlocked it, and jumped out. Well, just like the Raymond Street jailbreak in New York last winter. Yes. Any trace of him? No. He just disappeared. Hmm. I assume the police have already sent out an alarm. Yes, they have. Have the knowledge of where he lived, who his friends were, Carl? I have his address, Jim. They're working on who his friends were now. No. Where does he live? An apartment house on Maple Road. You got the number? 728. 728 Maple Road. That's right. Police been over there? Yeah. So far, he hasn't shown up. Oh, I don't imagine he will. Not there. 
But I think we should search the place, Carl. Might give us some lead on where he could be found. I'll pick up a search warrant and meet you over there. Just a minute. Hello, honey. Uh Uh-oh. Come in, Bob. Thanks. Well, everything worked fine. Yeah? Mm Mm-hmm. Make me a drink, honey, and I'll tell you all about it. Sure. You know, I owe a great deal of thanks to Uncle Ed. How's that? Oh, he taught me well. I used his technique today, and it worked like a charm. His boys were delighted to come over with me. Do you want soda? Please. Here you are. Thanks. Aren't you drinking? Not right now. No. A toast to Uncle Ed. Thanks, kid. But Thanks for the toast. Uncle Ed. <laughs> what are you doing here? Oh, Lara's an old friend of mine. I, I mean, I thought you were in jail. I was. How did you get out? Busted out. Oh, Well, congratulations. Stop the con, kid. I know everything that's happened. What do you mean? I've just been having a nice long talk with Lara. She gave me the full rundown. Lara, you told her? Yes. You see, kid, there's a couple of lessons I didn't give you. The first one is never trust a dame. They always play the winner. I see what you mean. The second one is even more important. Don't ever double-cross anyone. Especially your uncle. Look, Uncle Ed... Don't try any tricks, kid. I've got a gun right here. And you know I'm the guy who can use it. Yeah. Okay, but... What happens now? Well, to tell you the truth, I really came here on business. Finding out about you just happened on the side. What kind of business? I've got to blow town. I need money. Lara, you're getting it for me. How? There's plenty of cash in that safe deposit box. Either one of us can sign for it, remember? Yes. I want you to go over there and empty it. I'll call one of the boys to escort you there and back, just to keep you in line. Jim, where are you? In the living room, Carl. Oh. I just went through all Shelby's bedroom. Oh? You find anything that might be a lead? No, not a thing. He's a pretty smart operator. I just looked all through his desk, and there's no personal papers in it at all. How about an address book? No, no sign of one. I called the police headquarters while I was in the bedroom. No, any developments? No, they've been working on Shelby's personal life. They learned that he had a nephew who worked for him. Oh, they think this nephew might be hiding him out? Not at his own place. He lives in a hotel room. Police went to his hotel. He was out. I see. They also learned that Shelby has a girl. Who is she? Where does she live? I haven't found that out yet. That could be a very important lead, Carl. Be very logical for him to seek shelter with her. Yeah. Well, there should be something around here to tell us no, something. No, I... Hey, wait a minute. What? Now, look, this is just a wild stab, Carl, but take a look at all those paintings on the living room wall. Yeah? Well, only one of them looks contemporary. There, that one. Portrait of that girl. See? Yeah, that's right. Say... It's just barely possible. I know. That's what I'm thinking, Carl. Look, there's the artist's signature in the right-hand corner. Let's get in touch with him at once. Wait a minute. Where are you going, kid? I I just wanted to get a cigarette. Well, Well, remember, I still have the gun. I know. Go ahead. Throw me one, too. Yeah. Thanks. You know something, Bob? You're not a bad kid. You just made your move at the wrong time. I'm glad you're that understanding. Why shouldn't I be? After all, you are my own flesh and blood. What happens when Laura comes back? Oh, I take the money and blow. Where to? South America. Do you think you'll get that far? Well, sure, why not? Well, after all, you broke out of jail. Every cop in town will be looking for you. I can handle that. Do you plan to take Laura with you? (laughs) What for? In South America, dames like her grow in bunches, on trees. 
Are you going to leave her for me, then? Well, <clears throat> not exactly. You see, kid, you're not going to be around. Oh. So that's it. Mm-hmm. A present from my uncle. Oh, I, uh, I wouldn't kill you myself, kid. I, I couldn't. It's like I told you. You're my own flesh and blood. Yeah, I know, I know. I got a much cleaner way all figured out. Like what? I'll, uh, I'll let Lara do it. She wouldn't. You couldn't make her. Oh, yes, I can. I'll hold the gun. She'll pull the trigger. There she is. Stay right where you are. She's got her key. Lara? Yes, Ed? Well, how'd you make out? Okay, I cleaned out the box. Well, come on in, come on in. Close the door. She can't, Shelby. Huh? I'll take that gun. Let go. Drive it. Got it, Jim? Yeah. 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 All right, Carl, call the police. Tell them we have their fugitive. Ed Shelby was turned over to state authorities, convicted and sentenced to be executed for murder. His nephew, Bob, was convicted in a federal court for theft from an interstate shipment and sentenced to 20 years. For her complicity, Lara Jackson was convicted on the same charges and sentenced to five years in a federal penitentiary. Tonight's case was brought to a successful close because a special agent of your FBI was able to recognize that one portrait in a room full of paintings was a recent work. A visit to the painter produced the address of the subject, and there, as you have seen, the arrests were made. Arrests which led to removal of these criminals to a place where they could no longer be a menace to the safety of you or any other American citizen. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Mr. Keating, Mary has been a mighty good wife to me. I've been thinking that the least I could do would be to fix her up with one of those equitable society readjustment income plans you were telling us about. Right, Don. One of the finest things any husband can do for his wife is to provide her with that extra income during the two tough years. She might need that extra cash to give her time to adjust her expenses to a new standard of living. I won't even tell her about it until I can show it to her in black and white. That'll be a grand surprise, Don. Get in touch with your Equitable Society representative without delay. Let him show you how little it costs to provide your wife with equitable readjustment income. Call your Equitable representative soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Uninvited Partner. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner, your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacy Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Uninvited Partner on... This is your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.